Hey, it's a great pleasure to have Anthony Speranza here today from the Perimeter Institute to tell us about anomalies in gravitational charge algebras of null boundaries in black hole entropy. Okay, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, wish I could have come visited. I had a great time the last time I was in Vancouver, but you know, maybe someday. <laughs> so yeah, I, so yeah, I'm gonna be talking about this work that I recently put out with uh, Ben Chandra Sakarin, um, as well as a, a work from earlier this summer with Lin Ching Chen and uh, three former master students at PI. So Wenjun Chua, Chue Liu, and Bruno Torres. Um, and yeah, uh, so feel free at any point just to interrupt me um, if you have a question or if I can clarify something. Um, I can't, I probably can't see if there's like a raised hand or a chat, so. Okay. So yeah, the idea is we're going to be talking about null boundaries um, in gravitational theories. So these are pretty important in lots of different contexts. Um, for, for example, uh, scry plus in asymptotically flat spaces is known to be a null surface. Um, and so it's kind of interesting from a program of flat space holography. Um, but things like event horizons of black holes or Cauchy horizons for entanglement wedges are also null boundaries. And so they're sort of a natural partition um, of subregions in gravitational theories. And so the thing I'm going to be talking about today is the idea of these quasi local charge algebras that you would associate with a null surface. Um, and so these are just some sorts of some kind of algebra of observable that you that show up um, on null surfaces in gravitational theories. So some examples that are a little more physical would be something like a Bondi mass when you're talking about gravitational radiation at asymptotic infinity, things like gravitational wave memory. Um, for this talk, though, I'm going to be talking more about like null boundaries at finite locations, um, and the the charges kind of go under the name of edge modes or soft hair on the horizon. And the reason I'm interested in these is there's some connection between these degrees of freedom that appear on null surfaces and some sort of microstate interpretation of something like the black hole entropy. So the general picture I usually have in mind when connecting these, these charge algebras to black hole entropy um, is sort of motivated by this extended Hilbert space picture when you're talking about entropy in theories with gauge symmetry. So the idea is um, anytime you have gauge symmetry in a theory um, and you want to talk about, say, the entanglement entropy of some spatial subregion where you trace out sort of a complementary region shown here, um, the issue is you can't really do this when you have gauge symmetry because the gauge constraints tell you that your Hilbert space doesn't actually factorize across spatial boundaries. Um, and this is related to the existence of things like Wilson loop observables, which can penetrate the boundary here. And so then there's no sense in which this Wilson loop can be localized to some subregion. Um, um, so the way you often deal with this in um, gauge theory is you construct what's known as the extended Hilbert space, where you kind of add additional, oops, additional charges at the boundary, um, you sort of break the gauge symmetry at the boundary by promoting gauge transformations to physical degrees of freedom in order to make the Hilbert space factorize. And you can think of that as adding these little pink charges at the end of the Wilson line to make it um, gauge invariant. Um, and the idea is you want to embed the physical Hilbert space in this bigger extended Hilbert space. And then once you do that, you can talk about something like the entanglement entropy in a subregion, um, there's this work by Donnelly on the extended Hilbert space entropy, um, where you can show that the entropy takes the form of sort of an expectation value of entropies within different super selection sectors, plus sort of a classical piece that looks like the expectation value of an operator. Um, and so there's some analyses of this type of construction in gravity as well. Um, there's this work by Donnelly and Friedel from 2016 which looks at how you would do this for a gravitational theory. Um, I did some work extending that to higher curvature theories. And I'm working on a project on understanding the kind of the resulting symmetry algebras. Um, and that's work in progress with Donnelly, Friedel, and Musabian. Um, so 
this is sort of the philosophy for understanding why you know these charge algebras associated with surfaces might have something to do with uh, entropy. Um, but the, the thing I'm talking about today is a, a related but slightly different construction, but it's one where you really can see the entropy coming out at the end of the day. Um, and generally, whenever this happens, it usually shows up because you're able to show that these algebras have some sort of Virasoro symmetry associated with it. Um, and so this, is, this type of story has sort of a long history, but the first realization of this idea was the Strominger calculation of the BTZ black hole entropy, um, where he used the you know, asymptotic symmetries of ADS3 and the associated brown hino central charge and showed that when you apply the Cardi formula to that setup, you can reproduce the BTZ black hole entropy. And he further mentioned in this work that he thought anytime you can find a near ADS3 geometry in some setup of a near horizon, that this should also give you some sort of microscopic description of the entropy. Um, and so this idea was flushed out a bit by Carlip, where he showed that really you can find such a Virasoro symmetry on any killing horizon. And similarly, you find, you know, when you apply the Cardi formula, you get an entropy. Um, and a similar setup was this Kerr CFT correspondence, where they were looking, the Kerr CFT was looking at extremal Kerr black holes and sort of the near horizon geometry there. Um, uh, and following that, there's been some work kind of moving away from the extremal Kerr limit. Um, so this work by Hako, Hawking, Perry, and Strominger was trying to understand sort of near horizon Virasoro symmetries for Kerr black holes of arbitrary spin, um, kind of motivated by this work by Castro, Maloney, and Strominger on this, where they found sort of a near horizon conformal symmetry of the wave equation in these curve backgrounds. Um, and so this construction, um, we extended this earlier this summer in this work um, with these collaborators to show how it works for arbitrary axisymmetric killing horizons. So this is applicable to a wide variety of black holes or other types of horizons as well. So the, the general story again is you're, you're gonna look for one or two copies of a Virasoro algebra and then you're going to apply the Cardi formula for a CFT with those central charges, which you computed. The central charges are computed from just canonical methods, just like in the brown Hino setup. And you're going to look to try to get an entropy out of that. And that sort of motivates the idea that these uh, charges are counting microstates of the black hole. And they're somehow described by a CFT kind of localized near the horizon. Okay, so the, the main thing that motivated the, the work that I'm going to tell you about are these, is this recent Hawking, Hako, Perry, Strominger work on this soft hair for Kerr black holes. Um, and they were kind of, it was an interesting work because it deals with what I'll call quasi-local or sometimes they're called non-integrable charges. Um, the idea is when you, the standard construction for these near horizon symmetries is you generally will impose some boundary condition at the horizon um, in order to make your charges kind of well-defined on your phase space. But this has the disadvantage of giving your horizon the status of a sort of physical barrier that's preventing flux from being exchanged with the interior. So it's not the most natural thing to do since you don't really believe there's some sort of wall sitting at the horizon. Um, the other reason that, so, in, so instead you want to construct something that I would call a quasi-local charge um, where it's not necessarily conserved because you can have fluxes kind of going into the black hole or coming out of maybe the, the white hole. <clears throat> um, the other reason that these were interesting for in this work is that there wasn't really a local boundary condition that exists that ensures that the charges were integrable. So, in the case that HHPS were considering, um, they were sort of forced into this uh, quasi-local interpretation of their charges. Um, 
So anytime you're looking at this type of construction where your charges aren't integrable because you're allowing fluxes, you need to employ this Walt Zupis construction, which is essentially just coming up with a way of still talking about these quasi-local charges. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, the, the main motivation for this work with then was to try to understand this HHPS construction. Um, and in order to do that, we actually had to think a little more carefully about the Wald Zupas procedure um, and understand various ambiguities that show up in that procedure. Um, so there's the first issue that turns out to be the most important is that whenever you're talking about kind of separating a charge from a flux in some of these setups, um, there's sort of an ambiguity in that. And this ambiguity ends up being entirely crucial to the final number that you're going to spit out at the end for the entropy. So you have to have a way of fixing this ambiguity. Um, and so that's the first thing that we discussed in this setup. Um, the second thing you have to do once you have these non-integrable charges is you have to come up with a way of defining their algebra. So coming up with a way of defining brackets, um, which is not immediately straightforward just because um, it's the, the, the fact that they're not integrable makes it a little trickier to do this. Um, and then the third thing you have to do is determine, you have to, so this we did sort of in general, and then the third thing you have to do is actually apply this to a null boundary, which is like the, the boundary of um, the killing horizon that you're interested in. Um, right. And so once all of that's in place, these three problems are solved, you can go look at this Cardi formula for um, the, the specific uh, symmetries that HHPS we're talking about, and we can try to relate this to the black hole entropy. Um, and so, yeah, one of the things that we did, so that HHPS had a very specific um, way of identifying, where they had sort of a guess for what the various decomposition was. And one of the things we did over the course of this work was show that there's additional corrections to the thing that they found. And so I'll go over that as we go through the talk. Um, so before diving into how these three, yeah, sorry, was there a question? Oh, sorry, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, before diving into these three uh, problems right here, um, there's something I wanted to focus on as I go through the talk is this idea of an, the anomaly interpretation of the, the various central charges that are appearing as we go through. Um, so generally, we're going to be looking for a bracket of these charges, which is reproducing the, the Lie bracket of uh, the generators up to a central extension. And we want to interpret this extension as being a type of anomaly. Now, um, so the reason there's an anomaly showing up is that we have chosen what I'll call a boost frame for the null normal. So null vectors are known to have a, an ambiguity, a rescaling ambiguity in their definition. There's no preferred normalization. And so by choosing some normalization, I want to think of that as similar to choosing something like a vial frame for conformal field theory. So similarly, in conformal field theory, you can choose um, the scale factor of the metric. And so there's going to be a pretty close analogy between this choice of frame and the choice of file frame. And we're going to see this choice is what leads to all of the, you know, the central extensions and various other things that look like um, anomalies as we go through. Um, and so this perspective is probably helpful just because um, it might clarify why there, you know, over the the years, there have been actually several different types of symmetry algebras that have been proposed at horizons um, to try to explain the microstates of these horizons. And they all are kind of different in their details, but they all have the same thing where there's some sort of extension that appears and there's some sort of Cardi formula that gives you the entropy at the end of the day. And so one of the things I, I'll try to argue for is that this anomaly that you compute is sort of the shared feature. Um, and so, and that's probably why there's sort of this universality, even though kind of the details of which symmetry algebra um, you're using are, is different. Um, and I should mention there's more to, the fact that you use the Cardi formula as well as sort of an additional input that um, probably has, you know, it's related to things like modular invariance. Um, 
And that's probably crucial for the entropy interpretation at the end of the day, but it's not something that I'll be really talking about in this talk, but it's an interesting thing to think about why, you know, the second step where you have to actually apply the Cardi formula is giving you the entropy correctly. Okay, so that's, that's like the intro and kind of the plan for the talk. I can pause real quick uh, if, in case there's any questions. Okay, so I'll go ahead and just dive right in. Um, so th there's the three points that I need to address for constructing these quasi-local charge algebras. Um, so we'll start with this walled supus um, definition of the quasi-local charges. Um, so the technical tool that I'm going to be using is this covariant phase space. Um, so I think at least some people at UBC are at least familiar with this general formalism um, since it gets used in these, um, these bulk reconstruction type uh, arguments where you get you know, Einstein equations from entanglement. But so I'll just try to do a, a kind of lightning review of the important features. Um, so the idea is you're, you're constructing a phase space for general relativity. The central object is this symplectic potential, um, which is called theta. And this is just the boundary term that you get when you are varying the action for general relativity. And so it involves, you know, just variations of the Christoffel symbols. And it's the thing that you use to construct the symplectic form for your gravitational phase space, where you um, just integrate the, you know, the anti-symmetric variation of this symplectic potential over a Cauchy surface. And so that's your uh, symplectic form. Um, the other thing is that you have diffeomorphism symmetry, and that implies that there's various um, other charges that you can construct. Um, and so the, the thing that shows up a lot is this another potential, which is denoted Q. Um, it's given by this. And when you're looking for you know, conserved charges, you have Hamilton's equations, which say that when you evaluate the symplectic form, on the transformation generated by uh, diffeomorphism, leak CG, um, you're, you're, you want that to be the variation of some scalar on your phase space, which is the Hamiltonian. But then you have this standard Iyer-Wald identity that this quantity here is given by the variation of the another charge, so that it looks like a total variation, plus an additional piece involving the symplectic potential. Um, and the reason there's a question mark here is it's not clear the second term is a total variation. Um, and we're gonna be considering setups where this term is in fact not a variation. And so there, this equation isn't true as written. Um, and that's what the idea is behind the quasi-local charges. Okay, so just to explain in more detail what the setup is, you're considering, you know, gravity in a subregion. So we have this, this subregion curly U. It's gonna be bounded by a surface that I'm calling, a hypersurface I'm calling N. Um, later in the talk, we'll take this to be a null hypersurface, but in general, it can be just any sort of boundary of your subregion. And so then sigma is like a, a space like Cauchy surface. Here I've drawn it as including part of the horizon, but that's not necessary. And I'm looking for charges associated with a diffeomorphism generated by this vector C. And uh, the interesting case is when C is kind of pointing off of the boundary of your, your Cauchy surface. Because this is the situation where your, your theta term is not going to be a total variation. So when it's not a total variation, what you want to do is decompose theta into what we call a boundary term, a corner term, and a flux term. Um, and this is sort of, a, allowing you to separate off the total variation piece in the formula I show you, showed you on the previous slide. Um, the reason for this terminology uh, is related to the variational principle for gravity. So this, this little L here is simply given, is simply the boundary term you would add to the, the action of GR. So it would be for a time-like boundary, this would be like your Gibbons Hawking uh, boundary term. And so you can show that if you add this little curly L to the action and then you vary it, um, you get your bulk equations of motion integrated over the bulk. And then on the boundary, um, you get the flux term right here. 
And so this is the thing that you would normally use boundary conditions to set to zero. And then this beta term localizes to the boundary here, the corner of your, your setup. Um, but so in situations where you don't want to impose boundary conditions, because this might be, you know, a finite boundary where you don't want to actually stick a wall, um, you just interpret this as a flux term. Um, and the idea is you separate off, you use these terms right here to construct a quasi-local charge H, which is kind of the total variation that doesn't involve the flux. Um, and it's given by this expression right here, uh, you know, involving these terms that we got from the decomposition of theta. Yeah, and I should, I should point out this, this relation to the variational principle and just a careful treatment of covariant phase space with boundaries is we're following pretty closely this Harlow and Boone paper that laid this out pretty explicitly how you're supposed to think of this. Okay, so this seems to give a, a nice definition of your, your charges. The only issue is that, is that this decomposition here is ambiguous. Um, so because in principle, I could just move, you know, part of this boundary term into the flux. I haven't told you anything that, that fixes what this flux is. Um, so I need to tell you a bit more in order to make this decomposition unambiguous. So the thing that we proposed in this paper um, with then was that this flux should be of Dirichlet form, which just means that it should involve variations only of intrinsic quantities. So if this was a time-like boundary, you would just have the variation of the induced metric. Um, for a null boundary, you also consider the, the null generator that's tangent to it as an intrinsic quantity. And so it involves variations of those, and then the things multiplying that are your conjugate momenta. And so this, basic, this resolves the ambiguity in fixing uh, the decomposition and gives you unambiguous charges. Um, up to some caveats, which are not really relevant for finite boundaries, but they're there's some, an interesting story for asymptotic symmetries there that I'm not really going to go into. Um, okay, and just to, so this, this Dirichlet form isn't a, entirely a new proposal. It's more kind of novel in the context of the walled Zupus procedure. Um, but this should be familiar from the, the Brown-York quasi-local energy, which basically does do this Dirichlet form as well. Um, and you think of the, the conjugate momenta here as the Brown-York stress tensor. Um, similarly, this should be fa familiar from holography where the Dirichlet form is kind of preferred. You think of the, the fields on your boundary as your sources, whereas the conjugate momenta you interpret as your operators um, in a holographic description. Um, we also had another argument that comes from you know, how to think about gluing subregions and in the variational principle. The idea is um, if you wanted to take your subregion and then glue on the complementary region to kind of give you the variational principle for your whole space time, um, you would sort of write down the complementary region's action. And um, when your flux is of Dirichlet form, that means you're basically kinematically matching the, the induced metric on the surface. And then you're, when you look at the variational principle, you get that the difference in the, the momenta, so this is kind of like difference in extrinsic curvature, um, is dynamically set to zero. Or if you actually had a brain there, this, this difference in extrinsic curvature would be given by the distributional stress tensor, kind of like a, um, like a, a junction condition. Um, but this one in, ensures that the induced metric is continuous if you were doing a path integral where you're also considering off-shell configurations. Um, so if you did like the contrasting setup where you were doing the Neumann condition, so this would be kind of a delta pi ij times gij instead, you would instead kinematically match like the extrinsic curvatures, but now you dynamically set the intrinsic metric to zero. But then your off-shell configurations here are involving situations where your induced metric is jumping on the surface. And that's quite a bit more singular um, than the ones where this matches. You get kind of distributionally ill-defined curvature. So for this reason, we are preferring the Dirichlet condition. And we'll take that as our way of defining the quasi-local charges in this setup. <laughs> OK. 
the, the final thing you can show once you've determined how to fix this flux is that instead of being conserved, um, these quasi-local charges satisfy a continuity equation. So if you think of evolution that moves you up the boundary of your subregion um, and you want to evaluate the charges on two slices, you can show that the difference of charges is given by a flux here, um, which is just, yeah, this curly E, which we're again determined, we're, uh, this curly E was the thing that we're we're, uh, is the flux from the, the decomposition of theta. Um, and so it's given by the, this flux term up to a correction um, that involves this curly L, which is this boundary term. Um, and we want to interpret this as an explicit violation of the, the continuity equation. And this is kind of the first place that this anomaly interpretation of this in this charge algebra appears. Um, so this delta CL is the failure of L to transform covariantly. So this first term is just how this transforms on your face space, whereas the second term is how it would transform if it was, uh, you know, a good tensor. Um, and so here in this equation, we see that delta CL is acting like an anomaly because it's, it's essentially an explicit violation of a continuity equation. So it should be viewed as similar to um, like an anomalous word identity where the difference of charges is a flux plus, you know, an explicit violation. Okay, so, okay, that basically defines how we, we talk about the quasi-local charges in this setup. Um, the next thing we have to do is talk about the algebra that these charges satisfy. Um, so it's a little tricky because um, you can't just evaluate, normally if you had integrable charges, you can just evaluate the symplectic form on the transformation. Um, and that, that gives you the Poisson bracket. In this case, it's a little more complicated because since we're considering sort of an open system that's exchanging flux with a, an auxiliary system, um, we don't really have Poisson brackets available. Um, so this, this has been considered before. This came up in this work by Barnish and Trossar, who were considering these extended BMS symmetries um, in asymptotically flat space. And so they proposed a definition for the bracket of this algebra, where you say the bracket is given by the transformation of, uh, you know, generated, that would be generated if C were integrable, um, and then it's corrected by a term constructed from the flux. Um, and you can kind of read this as like a time dependent uh, Hamilton's equations. If you think of this as like the total time derivative of H zeta, and then this term is the bracket. And then if you move this to the other side, you can think of this as the explicit time dependence of zeta coming from the fact that you're losing flux. So that's kind of intuitively how to read this equation. Um, so one of the, there's a couple nice properties of this. First, if you actually have boundary conditions that are ensuring that your charges are integrable, this is actually the Dirac bracket uh, of these charges. And the second property that's useful is that you can prove that the, this bracket satisfies this charge representation theorem, which just says the bracket reproduces the Lie bracket of the vector fields up to an extension. Um, and so this extension is actually an abelian extension in general, which means that the, the, H, the H's can act non-trivially on the K's, but the K's will commute amongst themselves. So the other thing that we showed in this paper was that there's actually an explicit formula for this extension term. Um, and it's again given by this anomaly type contribution coming from the boundary term. And so this is, again, where I wanted to emphasize this, uh, this role of the, the central extension or abelian extension is appearing as an anomaly um, in your algebra. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, and so the, just to emphasize, this is really analogous to the way holographic vial anomalies um, appear in ADS-CFT where what you do there is you, you write down a bunch of boundary terms um, to, to do holographic renormalization of the action. And um, the, the 
basically the anomalous transformation of those boundary terms under radial uh, reparameterizations are what lead to vile anomalies in the CFT. Um, and so here I'm just saying that that's sort of a general feature of these, these algebras at finite boundaries. Okay. Um, okay, so that's kind of a general setup that actually applies for any type of boundary. Um, but now we need to specialize to a null boundary and there's just a few things there that it's a little, it's slightly more complicated than a time-like boundary just because null surfaces are a bit more, you know, detailed in their handling. So just to do a quick review of how you deal with null boundaries in GR, um, in general, we're going to start with, we're going to take N, the, the boundary to be null, and you have a null normal, which we'll call L downstairs. And what we're going to do is, is, decide to fix this null normal. So even though there's no preferred normalization, we're just going to, um, yeah, sorry, actually I can't, uh, I can't exactly see the chat. If you wanted to just ask, ask the question. Uh, <laughs> Is there an, a question right now? I, I can read it out in less. The person oh, okay. Josh had wanted to read it out there. I'll, I'll read it out since uh, he hasn't unmuted. Okay. Uh, he wrote, you're calling this an anomaly, but it seems everything you are doing is classical, except maybe when you invoke the Cardi formula, is this just a matter of vocabulary or is there something quantum happening in the background? Oh, he says, sorry, right. I can't use a microphone right now. Yeah, okay. So that's again why it's, it's true. This, is, this really is showing up as a classical anomaly. Um, but I wanted to emphasize that this is exactly how your holographic vial anomalies show up in ADS CFT. They're again also from the, the GR perspective, they really look like classical anomalies associated with just writing down boundary terms when you do the holographic renormalization. So it's sort of we're invoking some ADS CFT interpretation as well, where you'd say, okay, if you know there's a dual quantum description. Um, you know, holographically on this boundary that we're considering, uh, we should interpret it as a quantum anomaly. So yeah, hopefully that, yeah, so that, that was, hopefully that's the, the general picture that we can think of when we're doing this setup. Um, yeah. Okay, so just to return to the, the null boundaries. Um, so yeah, so we, the idea is we're gonna pick a frame for this null normal, and this is, this is going to be the thing that we fixed um, in order, and it'll be, the fact that we fixed this is gonna induce all of the anomalies that we're talking about. And then because this is an, if we want this to be a null surface, we have to further constrain the variations of the metric to preserve the fact that L dot L is zero. Um, but then the point is we don't wanna impose any other boundary conditions on the variations just because the symmetries that we're eventually gonna be talking about do not preserve any sort of local boundary condition you might wanna impose. Okay, so after we do that, um, you have to just decompose the, the fields on the null surface. So you have the intrinsic geometry consists of a degenerate metric that's just you know the metric pulled back to the null surface and the null generator L upstairs, which since it's null, the upstairs vector is tangent to your surface. Then the extrinsic geometry is given by this shape tensor. It comes from just the covariant derivative of L and then appropriately pulled back to the null surface. The reason we call this the shape tensor is that it's given by a piece that looks like, so in, if this were a time-like surface, this thing would be essentially the same thing as the extrinsic curvature. Because it's a null surface and things are a little degenerate there, you have a slightly different decomposition. So you have this Kij, which is like, which we call the extrinsic curvature, but that's really the extrinsic curvature of like the co-dimension two slices of the horizon. And then you have some additional pieces here. Um, omega, which is the, which we call the Hadjic, this is called the Hadjicek one form and it's related kind of to the rotation of the horizon. And then K is the inaffinity. This is just the fact that LA need not be affinely parameterized on the, on the horizon. Okay, so once you have this, this 
geometry all set up, um, you uh, can go ahead and then carry out this decomposition that we talked about in general. So we're going to take symplectic potential and we want to turn it into a total variation, a corner, and this flux term, where again, the flux term is supposed to only involve variations of the intrinsic quantities. And so when you go through that, the result is the following. So the boundary term here is basically constructed from this infinity. So this is sort of the null boundary analog of the gibbons Hawking term. Um, and so this eta is just kind of a volume form on the horizon. And so this, this null boundary term has shown up uh, somewhat recently uh, in these works here, in particular, some people who were interested in complexity of the Wheeler DeWitt patch. They needed to know the various boundary terms you add when you have a null boundary. Um, the other thing that's, so this is the thing that's going to be important for the central charges, and that'll kind of be the central player. But it's also interesting, kind of an interesting byproduct of this analysis where, where the expressions of these pi ij's and pi i just because these are like your null analogs of the Brown-York stress tensor. So this is your Brown-York stress tensor if you were on a uh, null surface. Um, yeah, so I, they don't play much of a role in the remainder of this. Um, although I should say the, the, the part that HHPS identified was basically given by this term right here. So one, this just involving this Hadjicek term. So one of the upshots of this product project was just to kind of exhibit the other terms that need to be there for various consistency reasons. reasons. Um, and so if you were interested in doing something like holography on horizons or null surfaces, I think these would be an interesting object to consider just because we know the Brown-York stress tensor is generally dual to the, the stress tensor on the CFT or whatever replaces that on the null surface. Would you say again what eta was? Eta is just um, a volume form on the null hypersurface. Um, ah, okay. I, can, I can write out an okay, expression. I understood. It's something like L wedge mu, where mu is like a, uh, is the, the yeah, spatial, spatial one, sorry. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, so, yeah. I, I guess I could say it's, you, it's well defined because we fixed L downstairs. Otherwise, it, it's kind of ill defined up to normalization. Can you say again what K was? K is the um, infinity. It's sometimes called kappa, but it's just L A del A L B equals K times L B. So L is not affinely parameterized in general. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, and so the, the important feature of this construction um, is, are these anomalies and there, it actually, there's a very simple way to compute this, which we showed in the paper, but basically you wanna focus on the fact that the only thing that we fixed in this setup is this L downstairs. And so that's the only place any non-covariance can enter. Um, so all you say is if C is preserving your null surface, um, at most, its action on L downstairs um, is to rescale it. Um, and this completely determines the anomaly of this L downstairs quantity because again, um, I said this capital delta is given by the variation on phase space minus the lead derivative, but I've told you that this term is zero just by that's our, that's our boundary condition. So this anomaly on L downstairs is given just by this rescaling you can call W is the boost weight of this object. And then everything else is determined in terms of W, just because this is the only non-covariant piece. So in particular, the boundary terms um, non-covariant transformation is given by just the derivative of W along the, the null horizon here. Okay. Um, and as a final kind of just way to emphasize the connection between vial anomalies and this, what I could call um, like a boost frame anomaly, um, uh, there's this picture that where this, where we can relate this boost frame for L and sort of a, a stretched horizon near the null surface. Um, so the idea is if you, uh, oh, the idea is if you, um, if you take 
if you define your null surface kind of as a sequence of time like stretched horizons, you can think of that as just by given by a function x, and then you take l to be the gradient of x, and that will determine a preferred l once you restrict to the null surface. Um, and so if you just reparameterize the foliation by, um, you know, by transformations that just, you know, reparameterize the leaves but don't change the foliation, all that does is rescale L on the null surface by a constant. Um, but then uh, that really ends up not really, those constant rescalings don't really affect anything. However, if I, you know, do this transformation where I go from, you know, the green choice of stretched horizon to the pink choice, what that really does is rescale L pointwise on the horizon. Um, and so since, you know, in holography, you know that the change in the radial transformation is something you can use to change the conformal frame as you go out to the boundary. And so here the, you're seeing the analogous thing where I can change this sequence of stretched horizons in order to change the boost frame of LA. So that's just to emphasize this connection to vial anomalies um, in a holographic description. Okay, so that, that basically can, concludes kind of the formal uh, technical aspects of the construction. So from here, I want to explore this, um, the specialized uh, killing horizon and talk about how you can use this to get things like central charges and entropies, but I can pause for any other questions related to the general construction. Okay. Okay, so the, the application we're gonna consider now is looking at axisymmetric non-degenerate killing horizons. So we're gonna take L upstairs to be a killing vector and it's gonna be the guy that is normal to the killing horizon. Um, anytime you have this such, and so axisymmetric means we additionally have a, a rotational killing vector, psi, that has closed orbits on the horizon. Um, and kind of the general picture is we're gonna think of the, if you think of the, the orbits of psi, that's gonna rule your horizon by a bunch of circles. And roughly you're gonna construct um, some diff algebras that are kind of the diffs of those circles on the horizon. So um, near any such horizon, you can canonically construct this radial vector just given by the gradient of L. Um, and the way to think of that is that, um, so L is gonna be, if this is like your bifurcation surface, L is gonna be your, your boost generator, um, and rho is like a dilatation generator. So that's what it looks like near the null surface. Um, and so what you can show is that you can use these three vectors to canonically construct um, a local Rindler coordinate system near the bifurcation surface. Um, so you, you, the parameter for rho is kind of like your tortoise quarter coordinate and you reparameterize to this x coordinate and then your metric is gonna look like a Rindler form times a transverse piece and then some subleading pieces that are related again to the angular momentum of your horizon. <laughs> Okay, so once you do this, you then can construct these conformal coordinate systems. Uh, so this was uh, described in this HHPS paper for Kerr black holes, kind of following earlier work on related constructions for ADS3 black holes. Um, and one of the things we did in this paper with the master's students was show that there's kind of a generalized conformal coordinates that you can uh, construct near any horizon. Um, the idea is these coordinates depend on two parameters, alpha and beta, um, which we're later going to relate to the CFT temperatures. Um, and you sort of, these W plus and W minus are sort of like twisted Kruskal coordinates. So if these guys were zero, they would just be the Kruskal guys here, but then you sort of have them twisted by alpha and beta. And so these surfaces of constant W plus and W minus are here, I've drawn it in black here. It sort of spirals into the, the bifurcation surfaces, so. Um, and so when you work out what the metric looks like in this coordinate system, um, it's, uh, it, it basically has an ADS3 factor up to some things that are suppressed by W plus and W minus. 
And again, the, the bifurcation surface is at w plus and w minus equals zero. Okay, so you, you exhibit this sort of ADS3 factor by doing this sort of twisting coordinate system, and then you're just gonna write down vector fields that basically preserve this factor in a certain asymptotic sense. Okay, so these vector fields look like the asymptotic ADS3 vector fields. Um, and so you can just write them down uh, in terms of these arbitrary functions of W plus and W minus. Um, there's a periodicity condition that comes from the periodicity in the phi coordinates that allows you to mode expand these. And you end up with uh, two copies of diff S1. And so this is your, your wit algebra right here. So from here, it's... May I ask a question? So yes. um, by asymptotically, what, what do you mean? Do you mean large y or do you mean, I mean, do you mean when uh, you're at the horizon or far from the horizon? Yeah, so this is kind of a funny aspect of this. What I, technically what I mean is I'm actually gonna preserve just this factor exactly. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a little funny because you can take y to zero and that can sort of, um, yeah. Right. So what, what, y equal to zero, it would be like the boundary of ordinary ADS3, right? Right. Um, Except that here, a, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so here it's kind of close to zero, but not so close that the dot, dot, dots are important. Yeah, and really what you're doing is you're actually compensating with W. You're, you're really taking W plus and W minus to zero, and it's sort of, yeah. So you're sort of compensating with that. Um, so you, you kind of rescale them as you're taking y large um, or y small or something. Um, I have to say it's not, it's not, I don't, in terms of the interpretation of these symmetry vectors, the, the most precise thing I can say is they preserve this thing that I constructed here exactly. Um, and so that, that might be something more to why that's the correct thing to consider, but um, at this point, I haven't really told you what the temperatures are. And when, one of the things we showed in this paper was that you can pick them freely at the level of the construction that we're doing. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's kind of a good question how exactly you should interpret this asymptotic limit. But for definitiveness, you can just say it's preserving this factor. <laughs> but let, let, let me ask again. Before you were talking about the boundary as if it was at the horizon, right? Or that's what I interpreted. Maybe that's not what you were saying. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, essentially, we are going to construct the charges. We're, we're going to construct, so, okay, the vector fields are essentially defined in sort of a near horizon region, and they're also defined, it on, the defined on the horizon. We're going to construct the charges on the horizon. Um, the reason we have to uh, do this whole walled Zupus procedure is that these vector fields have kind of singularities. So one set of vector fields will be singular on each horizon. So, you know, like this one is singular on the past horizon and this one's singular on the, or this one's singular on the future and this is singular on the past. So you sort of construct them in a regulated way where you're not quite at the bifurcation surface and then you take a limit at the end. And that's why you actually have to be careful with the walled Zupus things. But yeah, so you end up working on the horizon. Um, but Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, it's useful to re-express these in this original coordinate system um, in terms of the, the, you know, the boost, the dilatation, and the rotation vector. Um, it's, not, it's not too complicated of an expression, but the really important piece is the component that's parallel to the dilatation. Because what you can show is this anomaly thing that we, we talked about um, is entirely determined by the component of the vector field that is a dilatation near the surface. Um, so you can show that it's this, this boost anomaly here is literally just this, this coefficient. Um, and that kind of makes sense because you can think of the boost as generating the change in the vial frame if you're thinking of the stretch horizon perspective. Um, right. And so once you've done that, you can just apply this formula that we have for the extension. Um, and it's kind of fairly straightforward now since we've worked this out. 
Um, and you get that these central charges associated with the two Virasoro algebras are proportional to the area divided by these alpha plus beta. Okay, so the, the final step in this thing, in this procedure is to now apply the Cardi formula. Um, and so in order to do that, you have to identify temperatures. Before you go to the Cardi formula, let me ask a question. Is there a version of this for 2D gravity? Oh, 2D gravity. Um, yeah, so in that case, you don't have the rotational killing vector, right? Um, yeah, that, that's why I'm asking. Um, it's something we, yeah, I haven't looked at in detail. It's something um, Carlip has had some recent work where he finds like a BMS3 type algebra where, I mean, the, the thing that the, the rotational killing vector is actually doing for us is giving us this periodicity condition so that we don't have, it was so that these guys aren't actually arbitrary functions. In order for them to be single valued, you actually get this mode decomposition. But so but Somehow you need that dimension to get an infinite number of generators, right? So Well, or it's to cut it down actually, because here what? this is an arbitrary function. And then I want to cut it down to things that are periodic and phi in a specific way. But in, 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 two, in two dimensions, you would have a constant, right? Not the function. Um, you, could, you would have like an arbitrary function of like the Kruskal u and v, for example. Ah, OK, OK. I see. Um, and so then, yeah, so I, I'm not quite as familiar with what Carlip does. There's always something a little weird, though, where there's some periodicity condition that they impose in terms of the, the Kruskal coordinate. Yeah, I was confused about the zero order uh, question of where the infinite number of functions comes from. And I think the way you are, you are, te you are telling me that they come just from, they are just functions of uh, u, u and v or the, the two light concoordinates. Yeah, I mean, yeah, in this case, they're these kind of twisted like cone coordinates, but. Um, I see, so they are reparameterizations along the horizon. With the horizon. Yeah, so on the horizon, they're going to look like reparameterizations. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so in principle, you could probably do it in 2D also. Uh, yeah, the, yeah the, the one hiccup is is getting it to actually be diff S1 instead of diff of R. Basically. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, there is some work by Carlip where he finds some BMS3, so it could be useful to think about it there. Um, Thanks. Yep. Um, Okay, so I should show you what the Cardi formula gives. The, the, the last step is you have to identify the temperatures to use. Um, and essentially, you can just look at the, at the vacuum near the, the horizon. Um, and if you say it's thermal with respect to the, the boost killing vector, and then rewrite that in terms of sort of the L0 and L0 bar sort of vectors, um, C0 and C0 bar, uh, you identify alpha and beta, which were these parameters appearing in W plus and W minus, as the temperatures. Okay, then you can, once you have the temperatures and the central charges, you can plug in um, to the Cardi formula. And so you arrive at this somewhat surprising result that the answer is actually twice the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. So it's twice area over 4G. So, okay, so this factor of two really requires an explanation. Um, and so the, it's not entirely clear what the explanation is, but I can give you sort of two different ways to think about this. Um, the first thing is to kind of think back to what we're actually doing in terms of the quasi-local charges. So again, since we were allowing fluxes, um, we're really thinking of starting with a system coupled to an auxiliary system and the fluxes go from one system to the other. And so, this goes back to this edge mode and gluing picture is that it's perhaps when you do this VT bracket for this Dirichlet flux, you're really not computing the central charge of a single CFT, but you're kind of computing the combined central charge associated with the system and kind of an auxiliary system that you're gluing on to collect the flux. So if you did that, this, so the idea is you would construct a quasi-local charge algebra associated sort of with the right wedge of the horizon, you would construct an algebra associated with the complementary region, and it just might, it just might be that the the bracket from this varnish trussard procedure 
really computes the, the charge associated with the you know, two CFTs that are sort of entangled with each other. So if you really did have a setup where you were entangling that two different CFTs, um, and then you just apply the Cardi formula, that just assumes your state's in a global thermal state. And so of course you would expect twice SB8, twice the black hole entropy here. Um, and then if you wanted the entropy associated with one side, you should sort of trace out the left side and that should cut it down by a factor of two. Alternatively, you could say, well, really I expect these to be in something like a thermal field double. So it's not really the thermal Cardi formula that I should be applying. And if I was more careful about how to actually do that, um, I should get back down to A over 4G here. Um, okay. So this was kind of a conjectural resolution. In order to check it, you would really want to kind of carry out this gluing procedure in more detail um, and show how this BT bracket arises from the, um, from kind of gluing on the auxiliary system and carefully uh, deriving the bracket from a Poisson bracket on the global system. Um, the other thing we did though, is we said, okay, you could now try to instead uh, work with a closed system. So try to impose boundary conditions so that you don't have fluxes from one side to the other. And so what we found when we looked at that, so I said before, there's no local boundary condition, but there is sort of a way to do these sort of weaker integrated boundary conditions that do make the charges integrable. But in order to do that, we found that it only works um, if you impose two things. First, the temperatures have to be related um, in this way. So the, the difference in temperature has to be given by this ratio of the, the horizon angular momentum to its area. And the second thing that we found is that the boundary term that you use in the decomposition, if you want the charges integrable, is actually precisely half the Dirichlet boundary condition that we were using before. So you can immediately see that since the boundary terms down by a factor of a half, and since the central charges were just linear in that boundary term, you're going to be down by a factor of two. And so you're, you're immediately, that's going to explain the factor of two problem that we had before. Um, in the integrable case, it's also a nice consistency check that you can also just evaluate the zero mode charges. So this is the, the charges associated with L0 and L0 bar. Um, using this special choice of uh, temperature and the, this choice of boundary term that gives you this factor of two, you get this expression. And in this case, the microcanonical Cardi formula um, is consistent with that. So if you did the microcanonical, which is in terms of L0 um, and L0 bar, you again get A over 4G. Um, is, there, is there some interpretation of, of this special choice? interpretation or it's just uh, an equation that you <laughs> yeah the where it actually came from was um so these these l0 and l0 bar um are the only generators that can be evaluated on either the past and future horizon they're just um they're some combination of your killing vectors um and in order for them to be the same if you evaluate you know l0 on the past horizon and l0 on the future horizon so essentially there's no flux as you evolve from past to future horizon. You just derive that the temperatures have to satisfy this, um, this equation. It just comes from literally asking that there's no flux. So I don't know. <clears throat> but yeah, I'm, I'm not sure the significance of this. Although I should point out that these temperatures are not the ones that, um, that were written down by HHPS. Um, so they're, they're just different from those. And so they're not, Essentially, yeah, they're just not those <laughs> temperatures there. So HHPS really do have to use this wald zupis procedure to get the correct answer. Um, so yeah. And so maybe just a final note that the fact that the microcanonical Cardi formula is working for in the integrable case, I think makes sense just because you need to have a closed subsystem in general if you want to apply sort of a microcanonical ensemble. Whereas the, you would expect the, the canonical Cardi to work more generally um, just because the canonical ensemble is you're thinking of a system coupled to a thermal bath. And so that's sort of the setup where we are allowing fluxes to out of the region.
Okay, so that's kind of the main story. So I can uh, just summarize what exactly we did here. So, um, so th the main point of this work was to gen we were generalizing this Walt Zupas prescription um, to try to construct charge algebras on null boundaries, um, and we had to impose the weakest possible boundary conditions that are consistent with a null boundary. Um, and in, as a way to fix the standard ambiguities in this construction, we argued for this Dirichlet flux condition. Um, and we also showed that this central charge that appears sort of quite generally anytime you're doing these, you know, gravitational um, charge algebra stories is always given by this, um, this non-covariant transformation of the boundary term in the action. And I tried to show that this is this should be familiar from the from work on holographic vial anomalies, where again there's it's non-covariant transformations of the boundary terms in your action that are giving you the vial anomaly. And so it's ho hopefully this explains some of the reason why these Cardi formulas are giving you a universal entropy contribution. Um, so then I showed that you can generalize this soft hair construction of HHPS to arbitrary axisymmetric killing horizons um, and found that the Cardi formula, if we were careful with this Dirichlet condition, is giving us twice the entropy. Um, and a possible resolution is that it's sort of counting both sets of entangled edge modes that are kind of building up the smooth horizon geometry. Um, and then we further showed the validity of the microcanonical Cardi formula um, when you were able to find boundary conditions to make the charges integral. Um, just to mention some, some possible future directions. Um, so this factor of two in the entropy formula is sort of the most pressing thing I think that would be better to understand. Um, and it would be useful to understand where this bracket that, this, that we're using, um, how it de is derived from sort of a gluing construction. Um, where you have the subregion and the auxiliary system to make a kind of global closed space space. Um, another big question that I alluded to at the beginning was the role of modular invariance in this story. So the Cardi formula sort of has two inputs to it. First, you need this anomaly to get, when you derive it for a CFT, you use the conformal anomaly to get the, like the Casimir energy on a cylinder, and then you use modular invariance to sort of relate the cylinder to the thermal partition function. And so modular invariance was sort of absent from this story. So it'd be interesting to see where that's coming in um, and how it's, it's playing a role. Somehow using the Cardi formula just kind of bakes that in for free. Um, um, it would be interesting to look at more general null surfaces. We, the specific application we were looking at were um, sort of killing horizons, but you know, more general null surfaces or asymptotic null surfaces like scry plus would be interesting. Um, in particular, asymptotic symmetries might be interesting for the whole program of flat space holography and celestial CFTs. Um, and this null brown York stress tensor is probably an interesting object in that setup. Um, and maybe one thing to mention, although is just that this, this general picture of constructing quasi-local charges and then allowing fluxes out of a subregion. Um, it should be at least kind of familiar from these recent models of black hole evaporation, where you're sort of coupling an ADS region at the boundary to an auxiliary system in order to make the black hole evaporate um, in ADS. And so it, there's, there could be some interesting applications of this general Walt Zupas formalism um, to understanding sort of the flow of energy in those models. Yeah, um, and so some other things you could do is look at higher curvature theories. And maybe since we discussed this a little in this talk, but what is the actual physical significance of these vector fields? In the end, they were just preserving this sort of, this near ADS region construction, but it was a bit artificial for the, the finite boundary. So it'd be interesting to dig a little deeper what the significance of those vector fields are. Okay, so I'll end my talk there and welcome any questions. Any more questions for Anthony?
I have kind of a general question. Um, I guess the question is, how should I think about these these symmetry algebras that are associated with some horizons? I, I'm just wondering how I should think about this maybe in in the fundamental theory. Uh, so I guess some of it's applicable even when we don't know um, some underlying description, but I'm just wondering, maybe even in, in ADS CFT or something, if, if you have some underlying quantum description and you, you could still have some black holes or something or some, some case where you 